Tonight, Nicole's path of destruction, the powerful storm marching up the East Coast, the remnants of that Category 1 hurricane bringing heavy rains and flooding from Georgia to Maine. The storm triggering tornado warnings in North Carolina and Virginia after doing massive damage down south. Many homes declared unsafe. Residents warned not to return. We'll have the latest from Florida tonight and the full forecast straight ahead. Too close to call. Arizona and Nevada still up in the air. Three days after election night. Hundreds of thousands of ballots have yet to be counted. Control of Congress hanging in the balance. So when can we expect final results? We're live in those two key states tonight. Taking time bomb, the terrifying incidents caught on camera, e-bike batteries suddenly going up in flames, the urgent warnings from police tonight, and the three tips you need to know to keep your family safe. Plus, the shocking takedown in Ohio. A suspect wanted for assault, leading police on a chase through a daycare. The dramatic moment they brought him down in a playpen right in front of those children. And shredding expectations, the action-packed documentary putting a spotlight on a group of fearless athletes who are carving a new path. One of the world's best skiers joins us here tonight to take us inside the groundbreaking film. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. Tonight, pretty much no one on the East Coast spared from Nicole's wrath. The rare November storm wreaking havoc from Florida all the way up to Maine. We will have a full track in just a moment. But first, a look at what this system has already done. The storm packing high winds and heavy rain, triggering multiple tornado warnings in Virginia and North Carolina. This swirling cloud spotted near Richmond late today. Nicole dropping inches and inches of rain as it barrels north, streets flooded near the airport in Boone, North Carolina. And it was flooding and storm surge that did the brunt of the damage in Florida. New drone video, you see it here, showing homes on the verge of collapse in Volusia County. Many of those structures deemed uninhabitable. Residents warned not to come back. Our Carrie Sanders is on the ground in hard-hit Wilbur-by-the-Sea and leads us off tonight. Today, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis visited the hardest hit areas. As the governor toured, police posting do not enter signs on 24 condos and hotels and also on 40 homes. Where do you live? Right here. And you can't go home? I cannot go home. Deborah Taylor, unsure when or even if she'll never get back into her condo. How do you feel right now? Numb, scared, but hopeful. The five-foot storm surge combined with an unusually high tide undermined foundations built on sand. The waves crashed down, smashing anything in its path. But what no one saw was the undertow, sucking the sand out from underneath the buildings. The question, are the pilings deep enough to still support the structures? During the cold deep in one of the building's underground garages, seawater driven by those waves began to wash in. David Marsh works yes. at one of this the now closed resorts. This whole backyard was my pride and joy. I enjoy taking care all the way down to every last blade. My pool, lounge chairs, canopies, and this is absolutely heartbreaking to me. Adding to the safety worries, last year a 12-story oceanfront condo in Surfside, Florida, collapsed, killing 98 people. Forensic engineers say the Surfside disaster is now part of any calculation. So I would think, especially after Surfside, that everyone would err on the side of caution. By state law, newer buildings are not allowed to have seawalls, only sand dunes. But those dunes that were here washed away during Hurricane Ian six weeks ago. Where was the dune? So, Carrie, right there where you see the outline on the building, that's where the natural dune That was. unpainted area? Absolutely. And yes. then the dune washed away, and so the natural protection was gone? Oh, absolutely. It's now a dangerous race to get personal property. This unit has moved an inch since we were here an hour ago. Inspectors taking pictures to document damage, warning residents don't take the risk. The, the worst houses aren't safe, and uh, people need to be aware that, that things could still collapse. Tonight, in the storm zone, fears that what was once is now gone forever. And Carrie joins us now live from Wilbur by the Sea tonight. Carrie, I want to show our viewers that video again, the aerial footage of all the damage. And, and what struck me as someone who grew up in South Florida, 
was that there's no beach left. And, and I think this is this is incredibly devastating. I mean, the damage is horrific. But for me, it's that this Daytona Beach area is gone. And so our viewers understand this was an area where the Daytona 500 started. People actually raced on the beach. You can't even imagine that anymore. So my question to you, Carrie, is was this years in the making or was this all Nicole? You know, there's two ways to look at it because there are some homes that are behind me down this strip that were built in the 1920s and they had been here until what happened just now. So you could say things have been normal. This is so unusual. But then client, climate scientists will tell us that the water levels are rising because uh, the ice in Greenland and other spaces is actually melting and we're seeing that rise. Understand this storm came ashore during what is known now rather commonly as a king tide. And if you haven't heard that term before, it's unusually high tides. You know that lunar eclipse we had the other day? This came in just about during a full moon. So it was a very high tide. And to understand this beach, and you understand it, Tom, but you know, this is one of those rare beaches, very rare, where you could actually drive your car up and down the beach. I mean, it was a hundred yards from the sand dunes all the way out to the water at high tide. And when I was a kid, it was 200 yards. I mean, I remember coming from high school, coming over here with my friends. It was like, wow, we can actually drive on the beach, getting the surfboards and going out there. And right now, I mean, it's dark, but right now there is no beach and we're not really at a high tide. All that water is in here. So a lot of people want to know, will that beach return? And there are a lot of businesses that rely on tourism met this one woman who has a uh, rental of umbrellas and she has uh, lounge chairs. How could anybody do that if they can't go down on the beach? Tom? It's a big question of what's going to happen there. And it's it's just it's so baffling. A category one hurricane essentially damaging this area possibly forever. Kerry Sanders, we thank you for leading us off tonight. Now taking a look at Nicole's impact as it makes its mark on the northeast where we are. Some areas on the path here have already seen heavy rain for the past couple hours and flooding is becoming the big concern. And NBC's Stephen Romo joins us now from Hoboken, New Jersey. Stephen, what are the conditions like out there? Yeah, Tom, Hoboken saw a lot of rain this afternoon. They're actually waiting on high tide coming in about two and a half hours from now, something they're very concerned about. But as you mentioned, we've seen this storm move up from South Carolina, North Carolina into Virginia, where there were those tornado warnings for Roanoke and Richmond areas. No confirmed tornadoes, but they did have reports of wind damage, including trees down in the roadway. They also had some flash flood warnings for those densely populated areas, meaning people here in our area, New Jersey, they are bracing for this storm as it continues to approach. And Stephen, real quick while I have you there, um, I, I understand that the weather is, it's pretty strange and Bill Karens is gonna explain this for a while. I understand it's pretty muggy out there for November in New Jersey. Yeah, I actually had to take my jacket off because I was actually starting to sweat, which is a surprising thing to be happening here uh, at this time. I'm interested to hear what Bill has to say about that. They are also concerned here, though, about the rain as, that has continued to come off and on. So it's uh, very muggy and uncomfortable out here right now, Tom. OK, Stephen Rommel for us. Stephen, we appreciate that. For more on where Hurricane Nicole's remnants are headed, I want to bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens. So, Bill, what's the latest on the track right now? Well, we're going to take this thing in about 12, 18 hours and be done with it. But we still have to get through periods of heavy rain, isolated tornadoes, and some gusty winds that could knock out power to a sum. So the storm itself is starting to move into areas of Virginia now. Heavy rain is in West Virginia, Western PA, Western New York. The heaviest rain actually from New York to Boston is already through and moving into areas of Connecticut and also southern portions of New Hampshire here. We got a break in the rain from Richmond to D.C. to Philly, which is helping because we've had some major airport delays in those areas. We've also been concerned with the heavy rain rainfall in the mountains in North Carolina. We had some flash flooding near the Boone area. Now we're watching the flash flood watches get eliminated. So once we get done with these airport delays, we're going to improve this this evening. Tomorrow will be likely better. And Tom, watch out for these winds tomorrow morning. Isolated power outages and in the 50s for uh, mile per hour winds will knock out some trees and some power for some people. Okay, Bill Karens for us. Bill, we appreciate it. Now to politics and the final contest to determine control of Congress. The estimated margin for Republican control shrinking to just five seats as Democrats held on to competitive districts 
in both Nevada and Maryland. But statewide races in Arizona and Nevada still too close or too early to call. Republicans still holding the edge of one seat in the Senate at this hour. Democratic incumbent Catherine Cortez Masto in Nevada now trailing Republican Adam Laxalt by just 9,000 votes as election officials say they could have roughly 90,000 left to process. In battleground Arizona, Senator Mark Kelly, take a look, widening his lead over Blake Masters, now up by more than 5%. But in that hotly contested gubernatorial race, Democrat Katie Hobbs pulling ahead of former TV anchor Carrie Lake, who is now casting doubt over the election in Maricopa County. Uh, Maricopa County set to release 80,000 ballots later tonight. We begin our coverage with Vaughn Hilliard, who's on the ground for us in Phoenix. Tonight, the future of Arizona and the U.S. Senate is still hanging in the balance, with nearly 20 percent of the votes still left to count for both Senate and governor, still no winners declared. It doesn't look like we're going to have the final results for a little while. Senator Mark Kelly's slim lead now widening against Trump-backed Blake Masters, who remains confident in his prospects, tweeting out, quote, we will overtake them and win. Elections officials urging patience as the days go on. Goalposts have changed. All right. And the reason that the goalposts have changed is because wonderful news, the great participation we had on Election Day. In Arizona, most of the voting takes place by mail and votes can be counted as they come in. But this year, a record breaking 290,000 Arizonans dropped off their mail in ballots in person, surpassing the 2020 presidential election numbers, according to the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors. Then there's another layer of protection that's also time consuming the signature verification process. If a signature on a ballot does not match the registration record, the voter has five days to reconcile the issue. We said time and time again, really try not to drop off your late early on election day. It's going to slow the process down. But people did it, and that's fine because that's their right. But even with officials providing a live feed in the ballot counting rooms and answering all procedural questions with transparency, candidate Carrie Lake still casting unfounded doubt. I hate that they're slow rolling and, and dragging their feet and delaying the inevitable, and they don't want to put out the truth, which is that we won. Lake ran a campaign that amplified Donald Trump's election denial now walking the fine line of criticizing the system in a super tight race she could still win. Katie Hobbs is not winning. She has never been winning. They're just not counting votes. Gubernatorial candidate Katie Hobbs responding in a tweet, quote, despite what my election denying opponent is trying to spin, the pattern and cadence of incoming votes are exactly what we expected. And even elections officials pushing back. Hey, frankly, it is offensive for Carrie Lake to say that these people behind me are slow rolling this when they're working 14 to 18 hours. All right, Vaughn Hillier joins us now live from Phoenix. Vaughn, I'm just listening to your report there and seeing that last section, and this is reminding me a lot of our former president already taking on a fight with election officials. Are both campaigns gearing up for an election fight once the results are in? And I mean a legal flight, fight with attorneys? Look, I mean, former President Trump, Tom, has already suggested there was cheating, though he has provided no such evidence or specific allegations. Uh, the Secretary of State, Republican candidate here, Mark Fincham, he suggested there were anomalies, but provided no specifics or allegations or any evidence. Uh, Carrie Lake has called, uh, suggested that this is that in, uh, elections officials are intentionally slow walking this, but there is no such evidence of that. So I put a question here to the county elections officials. Have any of the campaigns come directly to them to suggest there were fraud or irregularities? And their answer to me was no. Tom, we expect tonight about 80,000 new ballot drop uh, in which results could indicate the direction of not only the Senate and the governor's race. So we are going to be looking here in these hours ahead to see if there's any major developments in which one of these or both of these races could potentially be called, Tom. Vaughn, but before we go, I do want to ask you, do we think we'll have some kind of answer this weekend or will it have to be next week? Look, particularly in the Senate race, Blake Masters is down significantly by more than 100,000 votes to Mark Kelly. And depending what these ballots here tell, tell us, if he is not winning these ballots by an enormous amount over Mark Kelly, it would suggest that he would not be able to close the gap. And we could be calling the Senate race this weekend and on the governor's race uh, if the likes of Kerry Lake is not performing above a 55 percent margin compared to the Democrat here. It would be tough for her to close as well. Uh, this weekend should be a very good, clear indication of where both of these races are going to head. All right. Vaughn Hilliard leaning into his Arizona background there with that Western neckwear. Vaughn, we appreciate the reporting and the look. All right, we move on now to Nevada, where tens of thousands of votes also left to be counted, with election officials fending off accusations of fraud 
as they work to process more ballots. For more on the state of play in Nevada, we're lucky to be joined tonight by the CEO of the Nevada Independent, John Ralston. He is the go-to election expert on the state, having covered Nevada politics for more than 30 years. John, really a pleasure and an honor to talk to you tonight. So walk us through Clark County, of course, where Las Vegas is located, releasing more ballots tonight. But what is the timeline looking like for when we might be able to project a winner there? Well, it's a good question. I mean, you came on the air at the right time. They just released 27,000 more votes, and Catherine Cortez Masto picked up about 8,000 votes on Adam Laxalt. Uh, she's only behind now by about 800 votes, so that race is essentially tied. We're going to have some rural counties reporting that are going to help Laxalt tonight, probably a few thousand votes, but then Washoe County, which is where Reno uh, is is going to come in as well uh, with as many as 20,000 votes. And Washoe County has been coming in very strongly for Catherine Cortez Masto. So this race right now is trending in her direction. John, I know you follow the, the voting and the counties and even the neighborhoods to a T. Knowing the votes that are coming into Reno to Washoe County, where you just said, you, you feel confident that these are going to help uh, Senator Cortez Masto. I think they're going to help her. The only question is how much. She has been getting more than 60 percent of the mail ballots that have been counted since the election in both Reno and Las Vegas. There's no reason to think that that trend is going to change. And it's very unlikely that there are enough rural votes in uh, uh, to help Adam Laxalt that are left out there. They'll help him a little bit, but not enough to make up for the urban votes, I'd guess. So a lot of people are scratching their heads wondering what's going on in states like Nevada and Arizona. Obviously, different rules, uh, different ways to count ballots because they come in at different times. You tweeted a good thread on this, and I want to show it to our viewers here. And here's what you concluded. Nev Nevada Dems must be really inept at fraud if they, as it looks, lose the governor, but sure... Catherine Cortez Masto survives, lose two other constitutional seats. You see how the fraud, there's no evidence. The fraud argument, which has no evidence, falls apart. Let's lose Nevada's most important office to make it look good. Insane. So we've heard some top Republicans already question the process, including Senator Lindsey Graham. What have you heard from Nevada voters? Are they getting frustrated? Are they buying the accusations of fraud? Well, of course, everybody's frustrated, right? The, the, the election was on Tuesday. It's Friday. We don't have final results. I get everybody being frustrated, but there's no evidence of fraud. And the point that I was making in that part of the thread is that the Democrats are about to lose the governorship, which is by far the most important race in the state. If they were going to commit fraud, my guess is they would make sure the governor, Steve Sisolak, got reelected. It's all nonsense. It's all it's all just uh, throwing the kitchen sink at, at this, as Donald Trump and Lindsey Graham are, have done in the last 24 to 48 hours, to cast doubt on the results. It's outrageous, and it's, it shows that they don't know how to add either. So, you know, with every election, election officials, journalists, voters, we all learn something. The Clark County Register, Jerk Glorio, has pointed out that they're still new to this, only two years processing so many mail-in ballots. Do you think the scrutiny on the pace of this count will force election officials to make changes in Nevada's next elections? I do. Uh, Joe Gloria is a total pro, and he's just following uh, the law here. Uh, I'm sure he's just as frustrated as we all are that they can't get these votes tallied uh, faster. There, are, there is a robust debate to be had about if you are going to have a mail ballot system, when the mail should have to arrive by, when, uh, when the deadline should be for so-called curing your ballot, that is fixing any signature problems. The legislatures are going to convene in February. I think there's going to be a debate, especially since the governor is likely to be a Republican who will want changes. All right, John Ralston, uh, straight from Las Vegas, live for us tonight. John, we thank you for bringing us that breaking news, too, at the top. Still ahead tonight, the e-bike warning, the motorized devices popular in cities across the country. But there could be a danger lurking inside them, what owners need to know. Plus, the burglary suspect leading police on a chase through a daycare. You heard me right. Look at this video. The takedown, I know, it gets worse, inside of a playpen filled with children. And a Colorado trip, we're not joking about this, taking on new meaning, how adults can now legally use magic mushrooms in the state. Yes, it's legal. Stay with us. Top story, just getting started. All right, we're back now with e-bikes exploding in popularity and some exploding in homes. NBC's Emily Aketa has a warning for riders. 
It's a staggeringly close call when charging e-bikes suddenly catch fire, nearly engulfing a young child in its fury. It's like a blowtorch where fire everywhere. As so-called micro-mobility devices like e-scooters and e-bikes have exploded in popularity nationwide, so have the number of injuries involving them. And officials say problems have been flaring up more during the charging of the highly flammable lithium-ion batteries. It looked like a really powerful firework. Mauricio Orozco says all it took was a single faulty battery to demolish his bike shop. All the cells from the battery were everywhere in the shop. So the explosion was really, really hard. An e-bike battery was blamed for this blaze, too, forcing daring rope rescues from a 20th story window. Here in New York, the increase in incidents is especially pronounced as commuters and food delivery workers alike lean on the devices to help crisscross the busy city streets. So far this year, lithium ion batteries have sparked nearly 200 fires in New York City, injuring more people than the last three years combined. Does that make you nervous at all? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, of course, the battery, I have to pay attention with the battery. And while officials consider policies regulating refurbished batteries, many acknowledge e-bikes are here to stay, reminding riders never charge the battery unattended or overnight. If the battery appears damaged, stop using it. And most importantly, only use the charging equipment made for your device. As fire officials try to steer the statistics in a safer direction. And remember, when you're ready to get rid of your lithium-ion batteries, you can't just simply toss them into the trash or recycling. You have to check with your municipality for the proper way to dispose of them. Tom? Okay, Emily Akeda, thank you, and we will be right back. All right, we're back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with a police takedown at a daycare in Ohio. New body cam footage shows the suspect lead police on a chase into the facility, facility in Warren, about 50 miles southeast of Cleveland. Officers then tase the man as he jumps into a play area filled with children. The suspect, who was wanted for assault and burglary, was then taken into custody. No children were hurt. Colorado is now the second U.S. state to legalize magic mushrooms with 93 percent of the vote in the measure narrowly passed with 52 percent support. The initiative allows for use at state regulated centers. It also legalizes private use, growing and sharing of psychedelic compounds found in mush magic mushrooms for adults over the age of 21. Retail sales are not allowed. Oregon legalized therapeutic use, therapeutic use back in 2022. And a powerful earthquake striking near Tonga, the 7.3 magnitude quake was centered about 132 miles east of the Pacific Island nation. No word yet on any injuries. A tsunami warning was in effect, but has since been downgraded. Turning now to an exclusive report on one heroic American this Veterans Day. Richard Engel takes us inside a CIA operation in the early days of the Afghan war. And like veterans across the country, one of the CIA officers involved is trying to give meaning to the battles he fought and the loss he experienced. He and his colleagues are taking on a new mission to help former allies and honor one of their own. Every day, veteran CIA officer David Tyson receives disturbing calls and texts from Afghanistan. Here's an example of a man who's accosted by Taliban, and you'll see him get shot. And we see this almost on a daily basis that shows us, obviously, that the Afghans are, who worked with us are suffering tremendously and under extreme was, threat. And the video is very difficult to show, but there was no hesitation. They were talking to the guy, did you work for the former right. government? I think they and were asking yes. him. Yes, how long, and then they just shot him. And we see, you know, just beatings and tortures and so forth that the Taliban take themselves. Yeah. The messages are from former allies who Tyson worked with two decades ago Hello, and whose are lives you? are now at risk because yeah. the Taliban are back in power. And it's just so distressing because they're forgotten, right? These are people who helped us, worked with us. Helping them, he says, has become a way to bring new meaning to the loss of his friend and colleague, Mike Spann, a CIA paramilitary who was the first combat casualty in the war in Afghanistan 21 years ago this month. The memory and legacy of Mike has been reignited, if you will, by what has happened in Afghanistan uh, recently. And it's given us a new sense of purpose. Tyson was with Span on a covert mission that would mark the start of the ground war. It's a story he has never told on camera. Tyson and Mike Spann were part of Team Alpha, 
An elite group of CIA operatives dropped behind enemy lines in Afghanistan a month after 9-11 in response to the attacks. Their objective was to gather intelligence on al-Qaeda and help Afghan allies drive them and the Taliban from the country. In November 2001, roughly 400 foreign fighters had allegedly surrendered and been brought to this fortress in northern Afghanistan. That's you, right? Right. Mike's behind me. You can see his rifle behind him. Tyson, a linguist who spoke eight languages and span a former Marine, had been sent to interrogate them. Help me understand at the moment, was the, I, was the thinking that someone might have information oh, about certainly. the next 9-11? Yes, certainly. And they all said, we gave bayat to bin Laden. We gave the oath. Bayat, loyalty. Loyalty, that oath of loyalty to bin Laden, and we are al-Qaeda. So this is the beast, right? An Afghan intelligence official filmed the interrogations. Do you have any thoughts in your mind that these people would soon rise up and be trying to kill you and Mike? No, not at all. Uh, that was not, that did not enter my mind. Tyson spotted someone who didn't seem to fit with the other prisoners. It's hard to tell, but he walked in a way that showed he was not used to walking in bare feet. They question him, but he refuses to speak. We can only help those guys who want to talk to us. We can only get the Red Cross to help so many guys. Do you know the people that you're here working with are terrorists? They killed other Muslims. Mike is doing his sort of good cop thing, and I'm doing the bad cop thing. That defiantly silent prisoner would soon make international headlines. He was a young Muslim convert from California, John Walker Lint, later labeled the American Taliban. Is this one of the last interrogations that you, that you do before the uprising? Yes, yes. This is one of our last moments. The prisoners should have been disarmed, but some managed to conceal their weapons. Suddenly the situation turned violent. I'm standing there and I hear shouts ex and a, an explosion, grenade explosions, and gunfire. That's when the uprising, if you will, begins. I draw my pistol and I, I remember very clearly looking at it saying, I haven't fired this thing in many years. Do I know what I'm doing with it? One of the guards runs towards me, and he has in his hand his notebook. And he's showing me the notebook as a sign that he's friendly. He stops in front of me just for a split second, and in Farsi says, Farar kun, get out of here, flee. Mike Spann is surrounded, and Tyson, who hasn't fired his pistol since CIA training five years earlier, has a decision to make. It's kill or be killed. And I hear Mike's voice. Mike calls my name a couple times. So you run over to him. I run towards him, and in that process, I begin shooting my pistol at men who are attacking me. There's a transformation that's taking place that I'm realizing. I'm starting to slow down. Things are moving in slow motion. I lost my sense of hearing. Uh, I have tunnel vision. But you're yeah. aware that you're living this I'm, moment and that it's yes. a different reality. And I'm somewhat floating. And then I go to Mike, and he's, he's shot. There's men on top of him. I shoot those men, and they're trying to take Mike's rifle. And I shoot four of them, and I take Mike's rifle. And with Mike's rifle, I turn around and begin shooting the guys who are now charging me. This is not a linguist anymore. No, no. <laughs> no. Uh -uh. You're still living this slow time? Oh, yes, very much so. No sense of fear, no sense of bravery. No, it's automatic. It's an automatic pilot situation for me. The sixth sense that, you know, everybody has, you know, when they're in situations. Situation. And I'm only picking out the guys who are charging me. I'm not trying to decimate the Al-Qaeda ranks. There's three, 400 guys here. I used all my magazines. I shot up 75 rounds down there. I don't know how many he killed, but it was at least a dozen, and it could be up to 40 or so. And that's just an incredible, incredible the human being is placed in this situation and has this choice of kill or be killed. And, you know, he took the choice of kill and survive. What happened to... To Mike. Well, he was shot in the head. So he died. He died fighting. He went down shooting the enemy. Tyson escapes to another part of the fort where he stumbles upon a German TV crew. There's a prison uprising. I just run across this field, and when I'm running across this field, I'm certain guards are dead, local guys are dead. And right. there's gunfire everywhere. Right. Mortar rounds are coming at us. No, that's not good. RPGs are coming at us. And these guys are good. These are, you know, genuine 
skilled, uh, experienced Al Qaeda fighters. Tyson commandeers the reporter's phone to call the CIA for reinforcements. No, we do not control the fort. We control one end. I think it's the north end. There's hundreds of dead here, at least. I don't know how many Americans are A quick reaction force is sent. I speak to them on the radio, and they can't get to me. And finally, they tell me, get out yourself. We can't get to you. We're taking too much fire here. Then Tyson leads a daring escape across an exposed roof. Tyson climbs over a parapet and down a 60-foot wall. And then we do a one by one. We fall down the wall, and we run out to the road. I use my empty rifle to stop a vehicle. The story of the prisoner uprising makes the front page of the New York Times. Because he's undercover, Tyson is identified only as a U.S. advisor. Mike Spann is given a hero's funeral. Tyson returns from Afghanistan and trying to make sense of it all fills eight volumes of scrapbooks. I was somewhat obsessed with that period and my experiences and this was a way for me to sort of deal with them. This is a photograph of the lucky boots. The lucky boots, these are the boots that I wore on 25 uh, November. They're now in the CIA museum. Uh, my son called them the lucky boots because I wore them and survived. Tyson is later recognized by the CIA with its highest honor for valor. Mr. Tyson is credited with saving the lives through his excellent judgment and great personal courage. Author Toby Harnden delves into the significance of the battle in a book, First Casualty, the untold story of the CIA mission to avenge 9-11. It was very important uh, at the end of the war to go back to the beginning. To, to look at what we were there for, what the um, American teams, CIA teams and Green Beret teams were there doing. It showed how things can unravel very, very quickly. Treachery, betrayal, uh, Afghan deals. And to me, there's a sort of haunting foretelling of what's to come over the next 20 years when the war changed. After some initial success, the war in Afghanistan ends in chaos. In August 2021, the United States withdraws its forces and the Taliban are back in power and seeking revenge. What was it like for you to watch the United States throw in the towel? For 20 years, we, we went along thinking that Afghanistan would, would prosper. When this happened, the disaster took place and we decided to lose a war. I guess not surprisingly, many of these men found ways to contact me. And they were stuck, literally stuck and being hunted down by the Taliban. And we made frantic efforts to try to help them. Tyson and Mike Spann's widow, Shannon, joined forces, along with other members of Team Alpha, to help the Afghans who fought alongside the United States and their families get out of the country to safety. Our government and administration can abandon and forget. What shouldn't happen and what did not happen, thankfully, is that individuals did not abandon and forget. And I left friends behind uh, that I never expected to need to help. But now's the time that I, if I can help and we can help, that's what we're going to do. So you're actively raising money now to help yes. these people stay on the run. Exactly, yes. And support them when they do get to places of safety. They say they've rescued about 300 people so far. Span's memory fuels their efforts to do everything they can. Mike's shadow is always there for me, and he's always asking me to be worthy of his sacrifice. Last November, members of Team Alpha gathered at Arlington on the anniversary of Span's death to pay tribute. Well, he's a symbol for, for various things that America stands for. Patriotism, integrity, duty, honor, and sacrifice. Their mission to interrogate prisoners in Afghanistan didn't go as planned, and neither did the war. But these veterans hope there's still some good to be done in the name of those they lost. Richard Engel, NBC News. We thank Richard Engel and his team for that powerful report. For more stories on America's heroes and their lives back here at home, join me and NBC Philadelphia anchor Lucy Bustamante for NBC News Now's special American Vets. Beyond the Battlefield, that begins at 10.30 p.m. Eastern, right here. Coming up, 
shredding expectations, a female-led documentary shining a light on a group of trailblazing athletes. And champion skier Michelle Parker joins Top Story next. She's in the house to talk about this groundbreaking film. Wait till you see some of the runs they do. They're going to blow your mind. Stay with us. And welcome back to Top Story. It feels like it got a little colder here. Maybe the air is a little thinner. It's because we're back with a groundbreaking documentary out of the sports world. For more on the film and what it means for the future of the sport, we're joined in studio by legendary big mountain skier, Michelle Parker, who's featured in the movie. Michelle, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. Thank you, and thank you for making me feel at home here. Well, that, that's what we <laughs> try to do here. They did a nice job. So most people, when they go skiing, they'll, they'll ski a green or a blue, maybe a black diamond. That's not you. Yeah, you're, we're you're going. For you're the going. Steepest stuff. You're going yeah. backcountry where there's no trails, and you're making your own trails. Talk to me about that lifestyle, and what that does for you, both physically and mentally. I think physically, it's uh, it's this beautiful opportunity for your mind and body to connect and to fully be present when you're in those mountains. When you're doing something like that, it takes an enormous amount of experience, first of all, but also just this this thing that happens. It's the most presence I've ever felt in my life. And I've been doing it my entire life, so it's kind of second nature in a way. But the thrill of it is like such an adrenaline rush, and it's just a joy to be out there, and especially in this movie, to get to experience that with a group of women. You know, you think of extreme sports, and you think of people like Tony Hawk and Kelly Slater, even Sean White. But you guys wanted to do this movie a different way. This is all women, profiling women, produced by women. And, and you wanted to obviously send a message, right, that there's this growing community of female skiers who are doing things just as wild and just as great as the men. Yeah, I mean, we come from a male-dominated sport, as most action sports are. And I think it was just groundbreaking in the sense of having a full group of women. We even had a female heli pilot one day. It was my first time in my 20-year career of being in the helicopter with all women. And to be out there in the mountains with each other, it just helps us to level up. And I always say, like, be the change you want to see in your industry and whatever you do. And this movie is... Yeah, well, we'll explain that. that. Like, what, what do you want to change? What is it? Do you, do you want to get more? You want to get little girls, younger women into skiing? What is it? Absolutely. We definitely want to influence the younger generation coming up. And then for myself, I want to help mentor other women and get them into the sport, get them into the outdoors, these places that sometimes they can be pretty nerve wracking to raise your hand and go out there. Um, but yeah, and then on the other side of the camera, too, like these women that are filmmakers, these camera bags weigh 70 pounds. Like, it's not an easy job, but these ladies did such an extraordinary job. You've probably watched hundreds of these films, right? And really? you've been around male skiers your entire life. What was the energy like when you were filming this movie and, and, and having just all sort of female ski teams doing these extreme runs? Yeah, I think that we support each other slightly different. We communicate differently. And out there in the mountains, when we're all leveling up together, like it just makes you be the best version of yourself. So that's a change I'd like to see in our industry is just being more supportive, more inclusive, and yeah, allowing these individuals to have the opportunity and for us to take the initiative to say, like, we want to do this. So let's go out there and make this film. What did you learn from making this film and, and, and having these, these adventures? I think I learned a lot about my friends. Um, specifically, I was in a segment with Brooklyn Bell, who is an amazing multidimensional athlete out of Bellingham, Washington. She's a young black mountain biker, professional skier, and fine artist. And kind of seeing her perspective of the industry and of the outdoor space and how to be more inclusive and how to like use my privilege to bring her into the space and to enjoy the mountains like Alaska with her. Some ski fans may say, listen, we, there, there are very prominent female skiers. We know about Lindsey Vaughn, Michaela Schifrin. Totally. But this, this is different, right? Explain. Yeah, I mean, I think Lindsey Vaughn and these racers are in the mainstream media quite often, and we are in the mountains like this, where there aren't cameras around, typically. We're not being showcased to the mainstream media, so to have the opportunity to be here talking about it is amazing. But, um, yeah, we do something that's a little bit different. And, sure. and, and to explain to people who don't know about backcountry skiing and this extreme skiing, you have to be taken by a helicopter or hike there. Yep. And there's not necessarily help close by. No, you're remote for sure. So you're stepping it back a little bit and keeping things a little bit more safe than if you were just at the resort. And you're relying on your team members. They're going to be the ones that are rescuing you if something were to go wrong. So we need to have that education and knowledge before stepping out into the backcountry. And, and also, you know, on the other side, the lighter side, it's so peaceful and beautiful and you're surrounded by mountains and it's, there's nothing better. I, I have two little girls at home. Is, is the movie suitable for them? Is it, is it for kids and yes. for, for all ages? Okay. Yes, definitely. And that was one of the goals, right, to, to get 
younger girls interested in the sport Always. and let them push themselves as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're seeing it grow. I mean, I've done this for 20 years, and now it's just expanding, and it's, it's beautiful. Michelle Parker, the film's called Nexus. We thank you so much for joining Top Story. Good luck with the rollout. We will definitely be watching the film more. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, as always, for watching Top Story all week. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.